Greetings, my name is Shalima Edwards, and welcome to Remembering Our Past to Strengthen Our Future. David Hamilton Jackson is the focus on this journey. He was born on the island of St. Croix on September 28, 1884. Some of his accomplishments and struggles will be shared, so please join me in this journey to learn more about David Hamilton Jackson. Okay, I'm here with Mario C. Moorhead. Mario, some questions about David Hamilton Jackson, St. Croix Labor Union, in remembering our past to strengthen our future. Hi, Mario. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm okay. good. Well, definitely in knowing about David Hamilton Jackson, I would like you to share with us some of your memories as a child during the time of David Hamilton Jackson. And it's a kind of loaded question to me because I grew up in a house with one of the founding members who was CRT Pro, happened to be my grandfather. And he was the bonded and certified treasurer of the union and also the chief negotiator. So I was fortunate to have a lot of memories, not of me being in the union, but of CRT Pro, my grandfather, who was a founding member and was in the thick of it. So that uh, I am one of the fortunate people, at least in this generation, to have a close-up view of the union, even though I wasn't there. Um, could you share some of the highlights about the strength of St. Croix Labor Union as was told to you probably when you were younger? I would be glad to because as I see it through my grandfather's eyes as told to me, the strength was in the leadership of the union beginning with David Hammond and Jackson. These were young people committed to use union and unionism to bring the people of St. Croix into the power that they deserve as the majority on this island. And it actually worked out fine for the labor union from its inception until about the year 1920, when division started to creep in and there was one problem after the other. But the highlights, I would say, was the unity that these very capable leaders under David Hamilton Jackson were able to achieve by informing the people as to what they were doing, why they were doing it, and how they saw it being in the interest of the people of St. Croix. What would you say caused the downfall of St. Croix Labor Union? Uh, unfortunately, much of the same infighting that we see today because when the labor union reached its peak in 1920 and was able to achieve a dollar a day and acquire thousands of acres of land and several estates, divisions crept in in that the very vice president of the union, Ralph de Chabert, suddenly found his president to be wanting in that he accused him of racism and associating with Reverend Barrow, who was subscribing to the black nationalist philosophy of Marcus Garvey. And this began the split in the St. Croix Labor Union in 1920, and then in addition to that, we had the likes of uh, Maurice Davis, 
uh, another brilliant self-educated uh, Crucian started his own labor union called the American Federation of Labor. And then Mr. Dishabot, the vice president of the union, took his opposition father in that he then charged that David Hamilton Jackson was actually mishandling the labor union's funds in the labor union bank, which brought about an investigation by the military rule of uh, the United States Navy, which didn't prove a thing. Uh, clearly, the union and Mr. Jackson were exonerated problem, but again, it, it proved the point that there was a lot of infighting, and then as a result of this, uh, Mr. David Jackson uh, decided that he was going to leave St. Croix and he resigned from the labor union to go to Indiana University School of Law. And so uh, I would have to classify it as pretty much in fighting as we have today that took place. But that one was, I think, fueled by more envy and begrudgingness than anything else because this was at the height of the success of the labor union. And as you stated, Senko Labor Union was the first labor union, organized labor union here in these islands. Absolutely, the very first in the Danish West Indies, the very first in the United States Virgin Islands, and the very first in the entire region of the Caribbean. Most, most of the unions that exist here are national and international unions. The members of those unions pay dues, most of which leave the territory of the Virgin Islands. And being that that is the case, the monies are not circulating here in the territory. Do you feel in which the members Union Jews leave the territory instead of circulating here in the economy of the Virgin Islands. Why do you think is the reason for this? Well, unfortunately, the very strength that uh, my grandfather showed me in the St. Croix Labor Union is the weakness of the many unions that we have today. Will we have strong leadership when the St. Croix Labor Union came into being. Now we have almost a couple dozen unions, but I dare say we have no union leaders because the leadership fails to understand what the purpose of the union is or to identify what the union is supposed to be doing for the members, the working people of St. Croix. You don't ever hear this. And unfortunately, because they don't have this grasp, they don't teach it to the membership, the unions in the Virgin Islands are under the false belief that to be effective, they have to have an affiliation with a national union and therefore send their resources off island instead of using it here. But this is all due, in my opinion, to the fact that we do not have the strong union leadership that the St. Croix Labor Union had in its heyday, the leadership that brought it into being. Okay. What would you like to see change in labor unions here in the U.S. Virgin Islands? Well, that's easy, following the point we were just making. We'd like to see labor union leaders develop in the Virgin Islands, particularly here in St. Croix. We need people who are dedicated like you are, Shalima. You are concerned about the working people. You don't have a union, but yet here you are, very concerned about this, and you make it your business to learn all you can about unionism and how it can help your people. When we develop 
union leaders like you could be, then I would say we have beginning to make a comeback to the same correct labor union leadership. About the purpose of labor unions, what do you think about it? I don't have to think about this, Shalima. No, they do not. Because we have not had union leaders cultivating the information to enlighten our people as to how it can be an effective tool for us in our revolutionary movement to control our resources, to control our lives. But if you don't have any interest in this, and you're just interested in having power and having the prestige of being a union leader like we have today, well, we have the results that we have today. We need a committed leadership who believe in their people and therefore strives to understand unionism and how it could best be used to help our people. What role should education have in addressing this, if well, any? Well, again, education always has a role for us because we are the majority population here. I mean, this is the way it's always been. African descendants are the overwhelming majority. And the mere fact that we had the very first labor union in the entire Caribbean we today can't ask one of our students to tell us, well, where was the headquarters of the first labor union in the entire Caribbean? That would stop them because they're thinking, Trinidad, uh, maybe it was Jamaica, you asking me, they wouldn't even stop to think that it's here. And that crucial in our discussion, we're talking about the fact that unionism is a tool that working people have available to them. The mere fact that our people don't know this speaks to how ineffective our union leaders are. Because, like I said, if you ask a student today, well, could you point to the headquarters of the first labor union in the entire Caribbean. The last place they can point to is the headquarters of the oil refinery we have here today. But nonetheless, that was the location of the first labor union in the entire Caribbean. That was the first headquarters of the St. Croix Labor Union. And I say that to point out how inadequate our education system is. I mean, what greater tribute could you pay to Cruzian people than the fact that they created the first labor union in the entire Caribbean? And today, you could take the valedictorian out of any school in the Virgin Islands and they couldn't tell you a thing about the fact that the first labor union was created right here. That speaks to how ineffective our education system is. And I do believe that, again, if we had a proper education system, something as outstanding as that would have to be a major part of the teaching, the schooling. So this definitely ties into the question that if you were a commission of education, what would you do to change or rather address this issue? Well, uh, the biggest change would be, you know, to throw out that outside-in curriculum and I would have to design a curriculum to teach our children first about themselves, who they are, and then what about the land that they live on, so that our students could best understand who they are, what is this land that they are, that they could understand how best to make use of their talents, their natural abilities on this fertile land. This is a place that produced enough for many, many European countries. But yet today, 
because of lack of leadership, we have no way of fulfilling our own needs other than to go to the outside and basically beg. And uh, I couldn't do that as commissioner of anything. Well, thank you, Mario, for spending this time with me. And sharing with, here with me is Renhold Ruki Jackson. Yeah. Hi, Brother Ruki, how are you doing? Fine, my dear sister. Nice being here with you. Same here, same here. Well, I'll call you Bru uh, Brother Ruki oh, sure, from, sure, you know, sure. as I'm comfortable in, in speaking yes, to you. Well, definitely, could you please share with the viewers and listeners about your relationship to David Hamilton Jackson? Well, D. Hamilton Jackson is really my great uncle. That is my father, father, two brothers, D. Hamilton Jackson and Jabez. My father came from the lineage of Jabez Jackson, Jabez. Mm -hmm. And that makes me the great uncle of D. Hamilton Jackson. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, could you share with us any stories or what was shared to you by your father? Yes. For the most part, yes, or, pro yes. or probably grandfather? No, my, my, my father. Okay. Mm -hmm. See, what happened, um, my father had two sons. Okay. My older brother named David Hamilton Jackson. Mm -hmm. And everybody called me Renhold Jackson Jr. When I found out that was not a junior, mm -hmm. I started to question my dad. Why didn't you name my brother David Renhold Jackson Jr.? Mm -hmm. My father turned to me and said, what did you name your son? I said, name Elijah. And you know, I practice Islam. Uh -huh. He said, why did you name me Elijah? I said, because I think Elijah was the greatest thing in my life. Mm -hmm. He said, well, let me tell you, in my lifetime, D. Hamilton Jackson, was the greatest thing that I've ever heard for black people in this inquiry. So one of the stories tell me is, if you really want to know about your uncle, study the scriptures and Moses. The people used to call you the black Moses. I said, but daddy, how? He said, well, look. The Bazen, he lived on that's the house of my sister, Bass N. That's where Bass them live. Oh. And he came and he, he was educated in there. He said like Moses was, right? Moses been in the house of Pharaoh and he was smart. Mm -hmm. And when he saw his people them in a terrible condition, like Diam and Jackson, saw his people in a terrible condition, he stepped in. So he said, if you want to know about your uncle, you need to know why the people call him the Black Moses because they see the similarity. You see, I must understand or not, even though I'm a Muslim, a Christian, the, the religious organization here had a great impact on us, you know, mm -hmm. and they fashion us. And don't misunderstand them old people because I think they couldn't read or they didn't went to school. Because your uncle used to teach them to read, so they could well read. Mm -hmm. Because I really didn't know any of the elders couldn't read. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And he said, your uncle was a teacher too. Yeah. He used to teach. I had my aunt who married to my father, brother, Sandy. She would tell me what, no, he used to teach choir in church too. Choir? Choir, right. Teach him to sing. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things that I heard from my father and really and truly my uncle wife, what I call it, Donna Jackson. You know, we talk a lot about D. Hamilton Jackson. Mm -hmm. One day she put a riddle on me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what bet is hope doing up there? You know how about it? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Because remember, you know, going through school, they never taught me their history. You know? I understand why they wouldn't do that. Because when I started to study this, and I studied my uncle, there was one statement that made me do what I'm doing now. Do my people do. There was one day a little boy in Hugginsburg and I used to call it the first street school for mechanic and St. Croix. My father used to take a lot of guys up there and teach a mechanic. And growing up and seeing that, it becomes part of me. My father said, boy, I can let you know something. Remember this. Do my people do. 
don't sit down and watch you know, three and Ryan Rogers all day, you know. At them time, that's the kind of mm -hmm. TV program he had. Mm -hmm. He said, get up and do. And I got up and I, right now, I'm, I'm pretty good in small engine. I'm pretty good in carpentry. <laughs> I'm pretty good in welding. Mm -hmm. uh, and farming is my love. Okay. You know, and all of these things was what I did because of the teaching that my father passed on to me. Really, it, it, it's a culture. Because you couldn't live in Frederickstead and find somebody that didn't have a trade. Mm -hmm. Everybody that I knew had a trade. Mm -hmm. He blew my mind one day. He said, um, son, because um, he was talking about the Hamilton Jackson and he wants me to carry on what he think he would have loved us to do. He said, I don't care much book or read. You could have it all up here. And you're smart up here. But if I can't put it out here, people won't look at you like a dummy. Mm -hmm. And I, pick, I, I, I read that to say, all your knowledge must be manifested. Mm -hmm. And when you manifest your knowledge, people will always talk good about you. Okay. But you can't walk around with a book. Mm -hmm. Intelligent and does nothing to help the people. And he said that's what he kind of some put the do my people do in that package, where he believed uh, one of the greatest things the um, Amdan Jackson wanted us to do is keep doing. So I took on the motto, do my youth do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. So this would um, bring this question now. In hearing what your father shared to you about David Hamilton Jackson, yes. um, what hope is there for the children of the Virgin Islands? I mean, uh, you mentioned about not being taught Virgin Islands history. But now in this 21st century, you know, do you see hope in the children of the Virgin Islands knowing more about, the, you know, ancestors such as David Hamilton Jackson? Well, let me put it this way. Hope for the youth. If they don't know what was, definitely you know they know what going on now, for the man is they're doing. And if the last know, he's the future. But there is. If we give our, and I'm going to use this term, our Caribbean people that live here, our history, which is all of us history, primarily in the late 1800s and 1900s, and teach them about all these gentlemen you see in my shirt here, you will have a better tomorrow. Because they have something to build on. Mm -hmm. Right now, you don't know your history. They're looking for anything. Mm -hmm. Somebody come with a style with a pants on, they pick it up. Mm -hmm. Somebody come with a new cigarette, they're smoking it. Mm -hmm. Somebody come with a new kind of gun and they black, they gone with it. Mm -hmm. They come with a new dress style, they gone with it. Mm -hmm. Because they are seeking to identify with themselves, and that's not themselves. Mm -hmm. I know my bringing up of learning these different skills come because my father make sure he pass on my history. And that's my history in my domain, in St. Christ, in Frederickstead. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, this is what we was. You got to do something. Mm -hmm. you, you, you stop school, you drop out of school, you have to learn a trade. Mm -hmm. But of course, um, I don't know much where they can learn a trade here, mm -hmm. you know? But he used them can only change if we the adults change our thinking. But you know, it's like a color look. And this is a bit strange when I say it this way. But growing up under the American lifestyle, under the American lifestyle, you are innocent till you're proven guilty. That plays a lot of my life. It plays a lot. But there are Africans who are brought up, you guilty, until you prove yourself innocent. And when we meet, we have a difference already. Just with that, we difference already. Plus, we carry on on a European mentality. Let me, let me break that down to you. Where I grew up, it was a village. When I say a village, my mother would say, I don't know. Watch out for them children. 
Now, the, the, the beauty of that, she said, watch out. We don't know where to go because we don't know if we want to watch it. So we walk a street like that's a village. Today, nobody look out for nobody. How are they going to change? Right now, there are people moving in your neighborhood and you don't know them. They don't know you. You look around and you see a lot of, and this is not this to anybody, but you see a lot of women sitting down in housing projects. Daytime. <laughs> Children going to school. Well, what picture do you bring? Lagoon project. There are bars surrounded. What picture do they see? What picture are we showing them, adults? A picture of things that are not productive. Look, I believe if the elders would be a little bit like Caspar Holstein, willing to help these organizations that are doing for you, it will help the organization to work with them in a positive environment and can do more. So basically, I, I do know about um, Casper Holster, um, that he being away from the Virgin Islands, he assisted David Hamilton Jackson with St. Croix Labor Union. But at, at a later time, that will definitely be discussed some more. But Brother Rookie, could you please share with the viewers and li listeners what you shared with me about the pigeon pea story. Oh, yes, yes, yes. My aunt is the one I always tell me about that. <laughs> and that one is, a, I mean, I'm still trying to analyze it. She said that when my uncle used to go around, she you know, used to go around to all the different plantations lecturing. And he used to tell them, look, plant your pigeon peas. See, and I, I, I now understand why that was done. Because coming from one master to the next, it was rough on them, you know. Mm. Coming from the Danes to the American. Mm. And there was a period of time in there, they weren't Danes and they weren't American. So they had to fish for themselves. And one of the things that I think my great uncle used to do was encourage every, I don't use what plantation they go to, he encouraged them to plant pigeon peas. Mm. You know, and I'm, I'm not going to try to study what is this about this pigeon peas. Uh -huh. But I know that when I eat a pigeon peas and rice, sometimes you don't need nothing but pigeon peas and rice mm -hmm. because of how it is fixed, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But I think that was one of the things that my aunt, the call it auntie Dona, she passed down to me and she always mentioned, your uncle always tell them, plant your pigeon peas. Apparently too, I guess it go, go through dry weather and when it rainy, it grows good too. Mm -hmm. So you will always have food. And of course, um, back then, it was essential that you had food because one of the uh, most uh, major activities or events that took place during David Hamilton Jackson. It was era. coming up. Yes. It was coming up, that like great strike. Exactly. And I listened to my dear brother Maru speak on it the other day. And I know, and I, and I want to believe that that's 100% right. There was a lot of eating pigeon peas. Mm -hmm and the plantation, you know, the elders them then, let me put it this way, the, the Africans that lived there, to me, they had common sense and they were wise. Because they could have, you know, like, you know, oh God, I'm gonna get in trouble for this. <laughs> they, were, they could have see things down the road before it happened. Mm -hmm. And I knew when D. Hamilton Jackson was preparing them for what we call that big strike. They knew that it won't be long. Mm -hmm. They knew it won't be long because of the way they were treated by the master. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, um, I had interrupted you when you were mentioning about um, Casper Holson. So if at this time you could just share a brief um, understanding of what Casper Holson did. What I understood that, um, that when my uncle was running the labor union. Casper Holstein bought some property in the labor union. I think it was Becky's Hope or one of those areas. We cross heads there. We come and say, you see, we don't have no heads up there. Casper Holstein, I buy that for labor union. You know? 
But me know what happened to it. And I when I hear the helmet and the accident, because I understood from how you know, Casper Houston used to give the labor union some good money, you know. You know, so um, all of that was story told to me right. about it. And I, you know, I, I think I'm gonna have to read up more on Casper Holstein because um, we need some of our retired people to <laughs> contribute. And those who are abroad, Virgin yes, Islanders. abroad, abroad to, to help the condition win. Because you ask me about the youth, them right, and this gonna be. I don't believe that the way we are teaching our children today are helping them. I know when I'm going to school, my teacher teach. I learn in the class. Homework was no major thing. But today, when you're dealing with children, they got so much homework, you can go two hours doing homework. And you know something? They rush into it just to do it, to turn it in. And they're not really getting the full understanding of it. And I think that is our first error piling children up with a lot of homework, where the mom is trying to hold two jobs, she got four kids, all in got barrage of homework, you are turning a parent away from the child. Mm -hmm. Oh, but do homework yourself. We think I sent to school for, you're dumb. And when we use those remarks, that too contribute to the destruction of the child. I, I heard this personally. Okay. You don't do homework, I'm gonna break your neck. And the matter of the fact is the child need help. And I believe you don't need help with homework. Homework should be something that you go over where they teach you. And you put a whole bunch of lessons on a youth today and expect him to do it. No, what you, you teaching, you know? And I would say education is the key. Okay. Well, before closing though, I would like to share, or rather like you to share, as you mentioned, being a doer. You know, um, you're, you mentioned that your father said that he was a doer, David Hamilton Jackson was a doer. Oh, right, right. Okay, so now in your aspect, um, Brother Rookie, I know you deal with the children. So you're bas you are doing things to help the children of these Virgin Islands. Well, well you know, in all fairness, mm -hmm. my energy now comes from the radio program. I don't care the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because in any radio talk show, you learn a lot. You wonder about a lot and you disagree about something. But when I hear certain voices and they like Mario, like Bert, I gonna shut my mouth because I have to go and do and work with these youth because that's the mouthpiece already. Mm -hmm. So I go out, I teach them small engine, I teach clarinet class, I teach bass class, I teach piano, I teach small engine and carpentry. How do I do it? I start from sunrise to sunset. If you're out of school running around and you want a long guitar, come by. Come by the youth center. You can't come nighttime, okay, call me. Call me before you come. No. I teach you. Okay. And then I have some youngsters just in the community. I help them with their work. They come by, we play some ball, you know, I teach them some music. I got a couple of little groups, little band, I teach them music. Because I believe that if we're going to change this time, see, I'm trying to like save them, not save them, save me. Because when I get old, I don't want them beating on my head, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. And if you don't try to save your committee, you'll come back and haunt you. Mm -hmm. So I really, really um, spend my time doing that. And I got to give praise to the Department of Public Safety. Okay. Because they really finance me to a degree. They give me a van, we got a building, we got an era. I got some police officers, they come in and they really, really... I mean, I feel proud because I believe that um, with me, you can't stop crying, you can prevent it. <laughs> And one of the things that I'm trying to do with Do My Youths Do is teach them something that they can make money from. Okay. See, so all my programs I got, they can make money. What sent me that way is the internet. <laughs> so many youngsters came through that era in the States, working, playing music, mechanic, <laughs> doing carpentry that come back and say, Rookie, thank you. I, I don't know for what I was just doing what I think I should do in a village. Right. Yes. Well, at this time, we, you know, it was a pleasure listening like to that. you, Brother Rookie. And again, this is, that was, um, who just shared this information with you was Renhold Rookie Jackson, who was the great nephew of David Hamilton Jackson. 
and of course remembering our past to strengthen our future the children are our future so again thank you yes, for sharing this information with us thank you dear. today is tamara johnson also known as empress nataki how are you doing good thanks Shalima. how are you doing i'm fine i'm fine good. and it's a pleasure to be here to um discuss you know your views especially as a government employee who was a former member of an international union, and now you're in a local union. Uh, what difference do you see in having a local union versus an international union? Well, the difference that I, I experience being in a local union versus the international is that you, your money stay here. That's number one. And the another key thing for me, Shalima, is the fact that your headquarters is here. So you have access to going in and dialoguing, researching, even getting information from the union about the union right here on island. Okay. Now, most union members believe that in paying union dues, all they should expect is just wage negotiations or representation, but they aren't aware that they do have a right or a say in how their union dues should be spent. Now, knowing about St. Croix Labor mm -hmm. Union, what are some ways you would like to see the money spent on a local union to benefit the members? Well, well first of all, land. You know, land is key. Um, a rich man is a man that has land. It always has been and always will be. So I would like to see um, the union be so organized and the members be so together that we can do things like purchase land, um, even sustain ourselves by having our own supermarkets where we get our fresh produce that brings in agriculture right here on the island um, after school programs transportation a fleet of transportation for the union members by the union members there's so much you know that i envision just sitting back and learning and knowing about st croix labor union it's a foundation because it did so much for its members then and we can do the same thing and more now now, talking about members' participation, mm -hmm. uh, what roles do you see that members should actually play in their union? Well, definitely you have to participate, not just by going to a meeting, Shalima, but you have to play a key role in even holding positions in the union. That's where you get information firsthand for yourself. You know, participating, being on committees, being in different um, positions, you yourself know what's going on, when it's going on. Nobody's bringing secondhand information. So active participation in the union is key. Okay. Well, thank you, Nataki, for spending time here with us. Is there any last thing you would like to wrap up in your views? Oh, yeah, most definitely. I just want to say to the government workers who are union members and those who are even thinking about becoming unionized, it's the leadership of the unions that make a difference. And like I just said, to reiterate, our participation will bring about the leadership that's supposed to be balanced and just and fair for yourself and for your children and children to come. So participation and leadership, having an honest and true need to sustain ourselves as members and even as owners of the local union. All right. That's why it's important for us to remember our past to strengthen our future. Thank you again, Nataki. Yes, every time. Hey, here with me today is Taima Percival, better known as Taima. And we're here at the historic site of Estate Bethlehem. I'm saying it right, Taima? Yeah, go ahead, my flow. A restoration site, indeed. And I would like for you, Taima, to share with us your understanding or through the research that you have done during the period in which David Hamilton Jackson and St. Croix Labor Union took place. What were the activities when it comes to government? Well, first of all, season greetings and a blessed Kwanzaa. And it's an honor here right now to be out here at the Bethlehem Sugar Factory Restoration Site and speaking on David Hamilton Jackson, our hero especially when we're talking about the 20th century, knowing that he came and stayed between 1915 at the age of 31. But at the time of 31 years and traveling to Copenhagen, Denmark, under the Danish West Indies, and farming the labor union, and then the labor union strike in 1916, by 33 years in 1917, 
he was able to be right here in these beautiful Virgin Islands that we call home when President Woodrow Wilson and King Christian VII signed the agreement. And when they signed the treaty acquisition in 1917, he, he adopted the 1906 colonial law, but then also the Congressional Act of 1917 put us under Navy rule. And so with being under the Colonial Council and then with Navy rule, it was what you call it dark days, meaning being under Navy rule. We had seven Navy governors from 1917 to 19. 31. But most of all being appointing Governor Kittle, because Kittle, when you see the VI flag fly today anywhere around, it was Governor Kittle that was part of drafting up the Virgin Islands flag that we have here today as the appointed governor. And from then on, David Hampton Jackson was able to lobby in as a labor union, which is against the Colonial Council. He was then fortunate to be a member of the Colonial Council in 1922. And then by 1923 and all, he was jailed for contempt of court because of the Colonial Council and things that he speaked out for and talked about with the Western News and the Herald. But most of all, from being a labor union to then joining the Colonial Council, it was crucial in 1926 to 1927, when he went to Congress and going to Congress and speaking to President Coolidge. At the time in 1927, it was President Coolidge, where he speak for the Virgin Islands to get citizenship. Because it was a crucial time where Virgin Islands did not, was Danish citizen or American citizen. They were just inhabitants or subject. And so being under the Navy rule now and knowing that most people was going to New York and had to go through Ellis Island, it was crucial to identify who they are. And so it was David Hampton Jackson under Navy rule had to deal with that day and went to President Coolidge. And that take place between 1926 and 1927. But still, he agitated be between assisting with the labor unions and still assisting with the Colonial Council for better living condition because it, under Navy rule, we did not have our Bill of Rights with a civil government. And so the colonial law still stayed in place. So it was still in 1931, he was then appointed by President Hoover to be a district court, the Superior Court judge. And so with being a judge now, in 1931 now, he was instrumental where the Virgin Islands were just feeling what you call the dread times between the recession of 1928-1929 in the United States where economic crisis was really rough, where unemployment, the Bethlehem Sugar factory site here went in bankrupt. And knowing that a few years before with the labor union shred with Mr. Lachman, them, he had roughly about 6,000 individuals he was working with here in the labor union and now to see unemployment several years after it was crucial so by 1934 being the judge he was crucial to assist president franklin roosevelt with farming the virgin islands company the virgin islands company played a big role in hiring back everybody for the sugar cane industry right here at the bethlehem sugar factory site again and besides assisting with that program there that's when the Virgin Islands get the Organic Act in 1936. The Organic Act in 1936, still we had an appointed governor, but with more a structural of a civil government, what you call a municipal government. But then the key part in the Organic Act of 36, where he was influential with, was the end to chattel slavery, meaning that the 1906 colonial law that went into the treaty acquisition, the law stayed in place until 1936. And so still as a judge, he was so instrumental in all of these endeavors that the descendants of slaves and inhabitants of subjects, or then Virgin Islanders was going through. By 1941, leave from being a judge to run for the municipal council where he made it and was fortunate to be part of the Municipal Council again until 1946 when he lose his life. At his funeral, so many people turned out and 
That's why they call him the Black Moses, because of the struggle standing for his people as descendants of slaves working in the sugarcane factory. So many people turned out, and from then on, we named that the Liberty Day that we celebrate in Grove Place, acknowledging it as David Hamilton Jackson Day. But what's so instrumental in the whole struggle when we're talking about David Hamilton Jackson as our hero, I always come back to Union. Union was played such a key role in the whole concept because throughout England's 17 crown colonies from Trinidad to Jamaica, all of them with sugarcane industry, they learned the importance of Union, meaning that in 1958 when the federations of England Crown Colony with Eric Williams and the Federation and Norman Manley. They learned from David Hamilton Jackson with Union more and the concept of the power Union can do when we're talking about Union Bank, Union buying land, and Ricardo that did because as descendants of slaves, <clears throat> the people that purchased land, which was Grove Place, Hard Labor, Roster Twist, were the first descendants of slaves in the Caribbean area to hold deed to actually land owners because most people working here at the Bethlehem Plantation from Mr. Carl Lackman era till to the Virgin Islands Corporation in 1966 were tenant working on the plantation. So what he did was build a self-interest of self-determination as individuals to move forward. So David Hamilton Jackson when you're talking about political science, political documents, union, and the struggle of descendants of slaves from Danish West Indies to the United States, what our Organic Act was based on international suffrage, meaning that international suffrage of Danish West Indies and the United States compared to England Crown Colonies, where England colonized them for over three, four hundred years, and their own was based on manhood suffrage. And so that was the distinction between the Virgin Islands when we mentioned David Hamilton Jackson as our hero. That is crucial to having a documentary when we come into public education that so much people could relate when we're talking about our political document to address our status or self our fifth constitution convention when we're talking about constitution and political documents to guide us for generations to come. And so I think it's fitting to have a documentary tree like this here and doing public education that people could learn some more about this powerful individual that born in 1884 and died in 1946. Right. Well, Taina, God bless. Definitely that was some information, you know, worth listening to. But before we go, I'd like you to share with the people estate, Bethlehem Sugar Factory site, and so that they could know, you know, what you're doing here. And again, at least they could have a visual of what you're talking about when you mention about estate, Bethlehem, and during the time of David Hamilton Jackson at St. Croix Labor Union. It's about the chimney. It's a landmark right now in St. Croix, which is seven miles from Christian Seton and seven miles from Freddie Seton. It's directly in the center of the oil. And if you're there on the Queen Mary Highway, the Midland Road, or you're there out to sea on the South Shore, you know that you're watching in the center of the oil. It's approximately 275 feet. It's one of the highest concrete structure with stone works in the inside and the whole island. But if you're interested in the history of the sugarcane era from the Danish West Indies to the United States government and the Interior Department, from under Navy rule to the Interior Department. You'll notice that when you drive around the island, you'll see Animal Mill, that then you went to Windmill. But this here now is a different thing, which is a steam factory. Meaning in the Danish era, you had the different design of the chimneys. But this here was built under the Interior Department, the federal government, between 1934, when the federal government took over after the recession of 1929, 1928, 1929. And this chimney here, with designing it, it carry away all the different sugar canes were coming from all the different estates. And coming here where I show you the lab a little later on to show you the different grades of cane that were coming to the lab. But that's why the chimney is so huge because you were dealing with the volume of all these different sugars that were coming from different plantations 
and coming right here to process. What we're watching right now is the mechanic shop. The mechanic shop plays a key role in the whole development of the 20th century in the sugarcane industry, meaning most people when it comes from locomotives from the Danish era to the American era when it comes with trucks start to come in, most people learn their trade right here at the mechanic shop. So the mechanic shop played a key role in the development of the industry of transporting whatever commodities they find the sugar cane, carrying it from different estates, picking it up, or carrying it to the dock, for the state dock or Christian state dock to export it. It was a key operation right there with the mechanic shop. And next thing was key and the site right now that is very important to restore is the lab building. The lab building played a key role from that Danish to the American era, meaning different estates that the sugar came from, blue ribbon or the white breed, whatever different breed of sugar cane. You came from the lab to see what kind of contents he had in the sugar cane, which is the best breed to produce on whatever estate. So this was a crucial part of anyone walking in the lab to explain more what is the best production when it comes for the sugar cane to come to the factory. From the factory, go through the whole processing of making molasses, making the brown sugar, and whatever commodities could be the breakdown of it. And then also, the great house. The great house played a key role. The great house could take it back from the Danish era to the American era. But what was so crucial about this great house here is it was mostly in the 20th century utilized as an office for Virgin Islands Corporation and Virgin Islands Company, meaning that Virgin Islands Company was from 1934 to 1948, and then they switched to Virgin Islands Corporation from 1948 to 1966. So a lot of the logistics that take place and the factory take place in the great house but then by the time in the 60s the roof was taken off and burned off just like when you see most of the residence house right here on our property we have about 13 residence houses here that is our future plan here these houses were built in 1934 most people that live in this house was part of the labor union with david hampton jackson in 1915 1916 with Mr. Lackman had owned this property at the time and then the Interior Department, the federal government, get this land and build up this residence house from that era. So it's the same generation. This house, if you realize, do not have no roof on it. By 1966, when we closed down, these the appointed governor, Ralph Pawanski, closed down Virgin Islands Corporation. They take off this roof, off this house. Most of these people went in Kennedy Project, Mombiju, LBJ to live. Most of them went in the housing projects that leave the plantation in 1966, which was roughly 45 years ago. So when you walk around here, you'll see a lot of ruins and remnants from the destruction of that era of an agrarian community. And we went to the industrial age where it was heavy aluminum at the time Martin Marietta were coming. And Martin Marietta Harvey Aluminum were the one taking these roofs off of these houses here to get the people more into the industrial age of petroleum, crude, and aluminum. So as you go around here and you see these 13 houses, Osef look over in the National Guard with the little bit that left from the demolition that they have done, you'll see that these are just the remnants of these ruins and houses that is on these properties from that era. And it's a crucial part of Virgin Islands history with and told history and documented history. And so what we're getting is the tip of the iceberg with the remnants of these runes. Hi again. Here with me today is no other than our beloved Kendall Siegel Peterson. Yes. Siegel, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, sis. Everything I do. Okay. Well, as you know, we're working on a documentary about David Hamilton Jackson and St. Croix Labor Union. Mm -hmm. So it's a pleasure for you to be here to share your knowledge with the people. Uh, do you think it's important for Virgin Islanders home and abroad in supporting a local union and why? Well, first I want to say thank you for having me here. And um, I say yes, it's very important knowing the history and what took place in the Virgin Islands and the breaking of the treaties that America had with Denmark with the repopulation and the depopulation of the Virgin Islands. 
is very important because if we didn't have that connection, we might not reach the distance we, we reach with the St. Croix Labor Union. And why I said that was because you have great men that left the Virgin Islands in the early 18, in the late 1800s, from 1850, you had Edward Wilmot Blyden, who repatriated to America to become a Presbyterian priest, and being rejected, repatriated to Africa, went to Liberia, and saw over 13,000 American, black Americans colonializing Liberia, and started a movement of liberation. Now, at the same time, you had men like Hubert Harrison, who also left the Virgin Islands as a young man and went to America and became number one in the Ivy League. He was, he was a natural born genius. You know, we have him in, they actually have him in the cartoons as the bulb head, the genius. You know, and um, he was the man that actually called the organizing of black people in, in Harlem. He would stand up on a ladder and speak to 7,000 people, come out and listen to him and, and his soapbox. And he encouraged the union movement. He encouraged black people to join you, union to get better pay in America. And then you had Caspar Holstein, who also left here in the late 1800s. And he was a butler on Wall Street, working for the rich Jews. And he started the numbers game. And by 1914, 15, at that, that same time, he was actually making $12,000 a day in his numbers game. Okay. What we would call um, Bolito, Bolita, you know, that would be the name then, which was the creation of the lottery. You know, but um, he had the ability now and the wisdom that that money wasn't just for him. So he became the world's greatest philanthropist. And right. they have him in cartoon as Casper the Friendly Ghost. That's interesting. Yeah, you, you, you see what I'm saying? And, and why I said that is because in 1928, Harry Kane, he sent two ships of supply here to St. Croix. Okay. Okay? And, and assist the people. And every Christmas, the children of St. Croix will get toys. You know, I don't know that much if it was also in St. Thomas too. But I know for St. Croix for a fact. And why is that? I think you had mentioned about your mom. Because my mom told me she used to get her dolly every Christmas and so, you know, so I know, I know that for a fact about St. Croix. And, and the connection with all of them is that David Hamilton Jackson's wife was Casper Holstein's sister. Okay, I'm glad that you're going there because um, I've heard several people mention about Caspar Holson and his involvement with St. Croix Labor Union. So definitely please emphasize about his involvement. Well, with that yes, event. because now what Caspar Holstein was also doing, uh, and like I said, Virgin Islanders, they established Harlem. Mm -hmm. The whole of the Harlem Ren Renaissance, the whole of the Marcus Garvey Black, Back to Africa Black Style Liner Movement, was on was foundation of Virgin Islanders. Edward Wilmot Blyden in Africa, Hubert Harrison in America saying, well, look, we're not getting equal rights. Let's head back home. Let's go and own the gold mines. Let's own the diamond mines. Let's buy the land. They had the money. The, the, the financing of the Black Star Liner was actually Casper uh, Holstein financing these movements. And so, you know, and also sending back Virgin Islanders, back to the Virgin Islands, especially St. Croix, you know, to invest in land and, and invest in the labor union. You know, so the, the relationship with um, America and the Virgin Islanders in America and the Virgin Islanders home in St. Croix was a very close-knit relationship. Okay. Actually, a lot of Virgin Islands had the ability to come back home and join the labor union and invest the money in the labor union and also in the, the homesteading programs that came up after that. You know, so if it wasn't for that relationship with the Virgin Islanders, remembering where they came from and remembering why they left, you know, to establish and, and, and enhance their families back home here in St. Croix, you know, the, the labor union wouldn't have been that strong. Okay. You know, because what Casper Holstein was doing at that time also was if a Virgin Islander wanted to move to America and wrote a letter to Casper Holstein, he would finance their trip to America. 
you know, and educate. It was the key was education and, and economics. You know, and Hubert Harrison played that eccentric role, that, that role, that essential role of organizing and centralizing. So David Hamilton Jackson didn't just do it alone. Okay. He had a relationship of brothers and sisters that was working also in the mainland. Mm -hmm. You know, with, they had their own newspaper. That's the same reason why he had his newspaper here. So everything that we was doing in the mainland, he was doing here. That's why the Virgin Islands St. Croix Labor Union is the first black labor union in the Caribbean. Yeah. To tell you the truth, I don't know if it was the first in America because what Hubert Harrison was doing is getting the black people to join the unions that was already there. Okay. Like the American Steel Workers Union with um, Billy Douglas Haywood and all these fellas here in America. And then when the black people joined these unions, they were laugh for equal rights, equal pay, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was always a problem. Mm -hmm. So they see that they wasn't getting, getting no justice in America. Mm -hmm. And that's how the Back to Africa movement started. Okay. You know, and, and the Back to St. Croix movement too. Right. So again, you know? emphasizing with St. Croix Labor Union, you mentioned, you know, Virgin Islanders who are abroad, you know, they felt or received the injustices that was going on. Yes. You know, that's what needs to be happening now because if you check the statistics, you'll find out that there are way more Virgin Islanders abroad than here, mm -hmm. home. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And if, if we could get the Virgin Islanders that's abroad to use their voting power here that they can use and also the economic power and organizing with the local unions, we'll be able to do what we was doing then with David Hamilton Jackson that, that actually gave us the empowering of buying the land. You know, we need Virgin Islanders abroad right now. To, to jump on this wagon here with the labor union so we could start to own our necessities, our supermarkets, our gas stations, you know, our, our building companies, you know, our agricultural industries. These is the things that the Virgin Islands Labor Union should be doing and also the members that in America that want to join this labor union. This is what we should be doing. The right. same thing David Hamilton Jackson then was right. doing. So just listening to you now it raised this question of, you know you've echoed it before but in remembering our past why is it important for us to remember our past for the sake of our future why is that because it's plain to see and we have a tangible product to show that if you don't remember your past you can't create your future that is why we have so much people in the virgin islands that that join all these unions that take the money and send it away and they get no benefits, they get no economic development here from the same Jews that they pay. You know, if in 19, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 come up the road, we was wise enough to put our money together, keep it here in our own bank and invest in our own land. If we was to do that right now, we'll empower ourselves to become owners of the Virgin Islands again and that is why you know, I strongly feel that the fight against our own union and the robbing and the, 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 the destroying of this St. Croix Labor Union took place. Because if we kept up doing what we was doing then, we would be the owners of the supermarkets, the gas stations, the clothing stores, you know, the, 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 the construction companies. We the people will own that as a, as a conglomerate of people and make life way easier. We will have our own agricultural industry. A lot of Virgin Islanders came back home from New York, mm -hmm. you know, and invested in land, you know, with the New Deal and the homesteading, when you was getting an acre for a dollar, an acre and all those days. That's why some of our people have large tracts of land, you know, but as I say, you know, if we kept the movement going, you know, because they had visions all the way up to 1970, I track it, where Virgin Islanders were still fighting to develop their own agriculture industry, okay. where they could have buy their food from themselves, which is a billion dollar business right now. Mm -hmm. You know, so if the St. Croix Labor Union, or for say the Virgin Islands Labor Union, whichever way you put it, 
was to establish themselves where they keep the Jews here. And also Virgin Islanders from abroad that, that want to be a part of that could pay Jews here. We will have the ability to own the supermarkets, own the gas stations, own the car dealerships, own the medical um, facilities, you know, own the, own the supermarkets that we need, the construction companies. And cost of living wouldn't be that high because we'll actually be investing in what we own as the people. Definitely. And that is, that is the downfall of the Virgin Islands right now, you know. The people don't own none of the necessities. The food, the clothes, no, the shelter. David Hamilton Jackson died on May 30th, 1946 on the island of St. Croix. See you next time in remembering our past to strengthen our future. Thank you for joining me on learning more about David Hamilton Jackson. See you next time.